Good morning. I'm Chris with Everyman Overland. So I'm here today, going to talk to you about a project that I've been working on for about the last week. Uh, last weekend, I installed a lithium iron phosphate battery into Janky here. I'll get under the hood and show you that in a second. My intention was to make a video coming at you guys about here's the differences between installing a secondary battery, whether you want to call it an RV battery or an accessory battery, whatever, but a secondary battery into your truck that you can use to power your fridge and accessories and camp lights and all those things while you're out off the grid. Doing that versus buying, say, a Jackery or an EcoFlow, any one of the portable power stations. There are advantages and disadvantages to both, and I'm here to show you those differences and kind of give you an idea of which direction you may want to go with your project. I can't say that there's one blanket answer like, you absolutely want to do this. There's also not a huge disparagence in cost. Uh, I'm in about $475 to put the secondary battery into the truck, and if you're out there buying a you know, Jackery 500 or an EcoFlow River Pro, which is what I have, you're going to be into it for about $500 to $550. So it's, it's not like one of them is $200 and one's $5,000, right? There's not a huge price difference. So let's go ahead and take a look at what I've got installed here in Janky. Okay. So here's the players. I've had my EcoFlow River Pro now, which is 724 watt hours. Uh, I've had that for about the last year, maybe a little bit more than a year. And mostly I've been pretty happy with it. Uh, I've got a couple of issues with it that, that have mostly to do with the way the rest of the industry and how everything else wants to be powered. Like you get a fridge, you get a, your spotlights and everything. Everything wants to be powered by that stupid cigarette lighter outlet, which is this outlet right here, okay? And that's just a terrible design. Uh, it's got the little spring-loaded deal in the front. It's always trying to push it out. It, it falls out. It falls apart. I don't think it really effectively carries a lot of electricity. And the only other options that they give you here, uh, they give you these two little, well, I think they're five millimeter ports right there. And those are great. And those are much more of a kind of a positive engagement where you push something into it and it doesn't try to fall out and it's not going to fall out but they're only good for five amps per side. Well, my refrigerator, when it's running, will pull 66 to 68 watts, which converts over to right about five amps, maybe a touch more than five amps when it's really going for it. I don't want to overload that style of plug and cause it to overheat and burn things down or melt things. As well, I've also found that the EcoFlow likes to shut me down. For instance, when we were up at Uwari, I purchased a diesel heater that I was gonna run off of this and make a video of, hey, you know, here's my diesel heater. Well, I couldn't make it work because if I powered it off of the truck, worked fine. Blue hot, it's fantastic. Uh, you'll see that in a video one of these days. But when I tried to plug it into the cigarette lighter outlet on the EcoFlow, this guy here, as soon as it got up and running, the EcoFlow would turn it off because it was asking for too much power. EcoFlow didn't want to give it out. I'm positive, 100% positive. If I got a small transformer and plugged into, plugged into these ports here on the side onto the 110 and just operated it that way, the EcoFlow would be able to power it just fine. Not a problem at all. But I'm also kind of sure that I'm going to be losing a little bit in the translation, running it through the transformer, and it's going to run through more battery than I would like to run through. So that's about the only downside that I have with the EcoFlow, uh, but it has a ton of upsides. First of all, it's easily portable. It's got a nice handle on it. It has multiple different connections. So you've got a USB-C, you've got multiple USB-A's. This is a fast charge. It's got the 110 on the side. It's able to do a lot of things that just installing another battery in the car can't do just all by itself. It has a charger built into it, so you can plug it into 12 volt or you can plug it into your house at 110 volt. And when you plug it into the house, it charges at like, like 600 watts an hour. It, it's nuts. It charges up. You can flatline that thing and in a you know, little over an hour, it's back, it's ready to go. And that is a huge advantage to these portable power stations kind of what we'll talk about a little while later, that it's already figured out. Somebody's already done the math. Somebody's already got it right. So you've got this little display on the front that shows you how much electricity is left, how much you're using, what's coming in, what's going out, how much time you've got left. If you keep it up at this rate, it's all there. It's all figured out. It's done very well. So what I have installed is this a10 power lithium iron phosphate battery. Uh, and you can see it's actually written out lithium iron phosphate. If you guys are looking online and kind of shopping for things, you're gonna see this Life PO4, right? Well, that's just lithium iron phosphate. 
and that's just the kind of the shorthand way of writing it. So if you're on Amazon and you're looking at things like, I don't know what to do, it's lithium iron phosphate. Lithium iron phosphate batteries, when compared to like an alkaline battery or the lead acid battery in your truck, or even lithium ion and a lot of other batteries, they tend to, as they discharge, they hold their voltage really steady. And then when they get down to about 10% life left, they kind of nosedive off the deep end. Whereas like your lead acid, it just, like if it's, if it's halfway gone, it has half the voltage left. It just kind of goes up and down, whatever. Other types of batteries will, will run that curve a little differently, but lithium iron phosphate are very good at that. They're also lightweight and they're self-contained. Like what's inside this battery, it may look like a standard car battery, but it actually has a whole bunch of little cells in there. They're about the size of a C cell battery, right? And they're all kind of tied together and they have a battery management system in there that makes sure the things don't go over voltage or under voltage. It'll turn it off if it starts to get too low and it will require too much of a jump start to get the battery going again. It has that system built into it. Uh, it also has the advantage that if you nick or kind of score the case of the battery, you're not gonna end up with all of the acid leaking out the side of the battery and leave you stranded on the side of the trail. So there's a lot of advantages to the lithium iron phosphate. They're lightweight, they go through, I think these things say they're good for about 2,000 to 2,500 cycles where you can charge it, discharge it, charge it, discharge it, and maintain 100% usability. After that, it drops down to, I think, 80% usability after 2,000 cycles, and that's, that's huge. Compared to, I believe they're lithium ion batteries in the EcoFlow, and those I think are rated at around 750 cycles. So there's a lot of advantages to the lithium iron phosphate. This turned out to be a little bit more difficult of an install, or, or really the, the install wasn't so difficult, but it's the usability and trying to figure out how to make everything work. Turned out to be a little more difficult than I thought it was gonna be, and I ended up with some surprises, and I'm, I'm not even really sure I've got it right yet. So I'll go ahead and show you how the whole install went, how everything went in, and then I'll get back with you and explain to you kind of where I'm at now. So what I have is which I think is their smallest battery, is the 50 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery. Uh, so this being 50 amp hour comes out to about 640 watt hours, which is important for the discussion about, do I want a battery built into the truck or do I want like an EcoFlow or a Jackery or something like that that I can take in and out? And what size do I want? Uh, well, if you're comparing all of that, this 50 amp hour battery is good for about 640 watt hours. So it's bigger than say a Jackery 500, but it's not as big obviously as a thousand. Or like I've got the EcoFlow River Pro, which if memory serves was 724 watt hours. Like again, I say, if I'm remembering correctly. So you're also going to need, as you do this installation, you've got the battery. Uh, I've got pretty much, I think, I think, I have everything that I need here. I've got the battery. I've got a battery tray that I'm actually going to mount to Janky. I'm gonna mount that into the truck. Uh, and you have to have some type of charging system. So these batteries, you can't, you can't just hook them up to the standard charging system in your truck. Uh, this particular battery has a max charge capacity of 25 amps. And I'm pretty sure my alternator is putting out about 100 amps. So you're going to need to use a piece of equipment that will regulate the amount of power being driven into that battery. So I have a 20 amp from Renogy, I have a 20 amp DC-DC battery charger. This charger also works as a battery isolator so that if you're out camping or whatever and you're parked and you're doing whatever and you're using this secondary battery for what it's for and you're running your fridge and you're running you know, camp lights or whatever it is you're doing, you flatline that battery, it doesn't affect the starting battery of the truck at all. So that when you get up in the morning, even if your fridge won't turn on, your truck will. So along with the 20 amp DC to DC battery charger, because I'm gonna be running such short distances, all of this is gonna be installed here in the engine bay, and so we're only running about, what, four feet or five feet there, something like that. This 10 gauge cable will be just fine. Now, if I were running a larger, let's say I was putting in a 30 amp charger and I had a 100 amp hour battery, I would probably want, if not eight gauge, probably four gauge cables, uh, but with what we're running here, it's small enough that these are gonna do just fine. I've got a battery hold down, I've got an inline fuse to make sure everything is safe. And I think that's good. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna get started putting this battery tray in. All right, 
So the area that I'm working in here, which I think is a really kind of common place for people who have FJs will mount a battery in here. It's just this great big empty space. Well, the only problem with this here is you can see not only is it filthy dirty, but this whole area, this is the inside of the wheel well. And so it's not flat and level, it's kind of rounded here. You can see underneath that it's only a single layer thick right there. So it'll be real good for if I'm you know drilling holes and I can mount bolts through there. But you can see as I try and mount this battery tray down in here, it gets to here and now I can just kind of rock around. So I'm gonna have to figure out a way, I'm probably gonna run bolts up through the front here and maybe a couple here. I'm gonna smash down that fender well, just flatten it out just a little bit to hold this a little better. And I think I'm gonna build some kind of support bracket to go underneath the back of this. But here I go, let's see how I can do this. Okay, so now, thanks to Movie Magic, you didn't have to spend the last hour and a half watching me do this, uh, but I've got the battery tray ready to go in. I'll show you what I've done. All right, so I've drilled some mounting holes here, here, back here. Made this little bar just out of some stuff that I had laying around over there. So it's gonna get mounted through these holes here, this one, and then two at the back. I drilled that one wrong. Don't pay attention to that one. We don't need that one. So the battery charger, you can pretty much mount anywhere you want. It's better, the closer you can get it to battery, the better off you are just because there's less wiring and whatever involved. But you could say, and, and in fact the batteries, you could even mount this battery in the back or whatever, you can mount it sideways, flipped upside down, whatever you wanna do. For your setup, it might be advantageous to take and put the battery in the back of the truck. If it's in a pickup truck, you could mount them actually in the bed of the truck. If it's an SUV like this, you could mount them you know, take a panel off the inside of the truck, like where the spare tire goes or something and mount it in there. I just have so little room that when we go camping, I run out of room real fast that I wanna put it under the hood. So this is where I'm gonna put it. So here's how I'm gonna do this. We're gonna take the battery. The battery's gonna sit in the tray like that. And then we'll take the charger will sit down inside the tray and I've kind of notched the tray so it holds it a little bit. And then I've got this uh, super, super fancy green, I don't know, Walmart, Harbor Freight, something ratchet strap that I'm sacrificing for this. And this is gonna ratchet strap this whole thing together. And that will hold the charger, let me get that out the way. That will hold the charger in nice and secure. The cables are coming out up here so it's nice and it's got good airflow. Uh, this is actually gonna be towards the back of the engine compartment. So it should help stop splashing and whatever from coming up there because you don't really want the charger to get wet. So this will go in here like this. The battery holder is gonna come down over the top like that and you know go through here and that'll hold all that steady. So now what I need to do is start working on the wiring. So the wiring that you need to do, obviously you're gonna have to run positive from the, you know, the positive of the battery and the negative from the negative of the battery, just kind of straight over to the charger that's gonna be off on the other side, and those just go directly there. I'm gonna put an inline fuse in this just to make sure that if anything goes haywire, it pops there and doesn't burn the entire truck to the ground. The only other thing that you have to put in here as far as wiring is on this little port right here, 
on the side of the charger, you wanna hook that up to a switched lead. So when you turn your ignition switch on, it will start charging the secondary battery from the main battery and from the alternator, and the alternator is charging the whole system in and of itself. But when your key is turned off, it turns that whole system off and actually disconnects the two batteries from each other so that you can't drain your starting battery from your, what people like to call their RV battery, the secondary battery, whatever you wanna call it. So I'll just kind of take a look. I will find either a fuse or a wire that is activated by ignition, uh, and I'll just tap into that to give it a source. You don't have to pull a lot of power from it, so you can use a scotch lock or whatever you like to, to actually activate that, and we should be good. wardrobe change, right? Because we're a couple days on now. Uh, I've had the battery installed in Janky there, and you can see it there. But other than using a, a voltage meter to check and see like, how, what does it have voltage in it? Yeah, it's got like 13 volt. I didn't know how to tell if it was charging or not charging. And I kind of like, I don't know, maybe I'm a bit of a control freak, but I kind of want to monitor that and see what it's doing. I want to know what it's up to, right? So I purchased a battery monitor. And this is a very no-name battery monitor, and uh, <clears throat> and I'm not trying to be insulting when I say no-name battery monitor. Like, there's no brand name on this box. I bought it off of Amazon. I'll leave a link down below because it seems to work fairly well. We'll you know we'll see as days go by, uh, but I couldn't tell you what brand it is. So what I've done, and it comes with this is called a shunt, right? So this is actually kind of like a little meter that detects all of the electricity that's going in and out of just this battery, okay? All of the, the grounds and the charger and whatever all comes to here, and then this goes to the battery there, so it knows exactly how much power is going in and out of this battery. And you set on the, let me go in here and show you, you set on the display panel, which is here, um, you go in there and, and you tell it exactly how many amp hours the battery is, how much is left, and it tells you voltage and charging and up and down. And So I plugged in a 5.65 CFM compressor that I just have sitting over here. I hooked it up to the battery, got it running, and that thing was telling me, ah, it's draining at six amps. So I know that thing will work. I haven't seen it charge yet, probably because we just didn't pull enough drain on the battery. Uh, to kill it to a point where the charger is going to want to kick on. So over the next few days, like I'll kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, I'm probably going to plug my refrigerator into it tonight and just turn it on like full blast and try and kill the battery uh, and just kind of see, again, uh, how we think this fares. So now all of the 12 volt charging ports in the truck, other than the, the single cigarette lighter style 12 volt outlet in the dash, uh, all of the 12 volt outlets that I have installed are all running off of this secondary battery. So I can plug anything into the truck that I want and we don't have to worry about killing the thing and it won't start in the morning. So I've got this SAE style here and then I've got a cigarette lighter and I've got a couple USBs up here. And then I have one more SAE style here in the back seat. And that's actually kind of where my fridge sits when we're out wheeling or whatever. I put it here and kind of strap it down so it doesn't go anywhere. And I can plug it in right there. And I think all of this is gonna work awesome. So how much does all this cost, you're asking? Well, boy, I'm glad you asked, because I'll let you know. So the EcoFlow River Pro, which I've got sitting right here, you can purchase one of these right now. I can see it on Amazon right there. Uh, they're selling for 579, 
plus a fifty dollar coupon so you're at 529 dollars 530 bucks for for the ecoflow at 720 watt hours the battery which again they sent to me for free uh, but right now they are selling for $179. And that $179.99 includes free shipping. And it actually showed up in a, on a FedEx truck. Uh, I don't think they like FedEx overnighted it, but it showed up quickly. I mean, it was, uh, it was here, I think, two days after I ordered it. That was very nice. So the wiring, again, I ran 10 gauge. I'm in $18.99 for the cables. Inline fuse, eight bucks. Renogy, 20 amp. DC to DC charger, $103 for the charger. If you're setting one of these up at home and you want to combine a solar panel with this or something to that effect, you may want to purchase a different charger. I saw a lot of different chargers available and some of them have the built-in you know, capability to run a solar panel as well. I don't have that and I don't see myself getting into that. So a 20 amp charger is gonna treat me just fine. Battery tray, 15 bucks. Battery hold down, $16, but it's pretty blue. And lastly, the no name battery monitor, which apparently has a name and the, the name is Gupshin. Gup. With a name like that, I wouldn't put it on the box either. Put it $70. And that's everything. So that gets us to a grand total with tax and the free shipping on Amazon, yay, of $438.17. So we're close enough not matter, about $100 less expensive than the EcoFlow River Pro, which will hold a little bit more electricity and is portable. So really, I mean, if we're only 100 bucks off, I guess the choice is kind of up to you. How would you do it? The problem that I've had with this and what kind of took me by surprise is is in the way in which all of the components kind of work together and whether or not you know does it have a full charge or is it not charged up. The battery itself, which I will tell you that the guys at Vic Off Road reached out to me and said, hey, we want you to test this battery and kind of tell us what you think. It's something new that they're doing. They have this ATEM power that is their own brand and they're selling it on Amazon and they've got their own website for it. I'll drop a link below so you can take a look at that. So they shot me out the battery for free so I could check it out. Uh, I purchased the charger, I purchased the monitor and all the wiring, everything else. I can tell you that taken individually, the battery itself seems to be of great quality. It's got these little handles on it. It's a, a nice sized package. Everything on it is labeled very well. So you know the 50 amp hours gives you 640 watt hours of power, which is more than you'll get out of a Jackery 500, not as much as you'll get out of the EcoFlow River Pro, but it's right there in that ballpark. It's usable. You kind of know uh, if I'm going out and I've got a fridge and I, I know this is how long I'm gonna be able to do this for. So I'm not upset with the battery at all. It seems. I put a full charge onto it, or what I think was a full charge on it. It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, I ran my fridge and at full kill, like actually running the fridge as a freezer, uh, it lasted me about eight and a half to nine hours. And that's really kind of what I expected to get out of it. So the battery is doing exactly what it's supposed to do and, and it looks nice and it's packaged well and fantastic, it's great. The charger. The charger seems to be working well and kind of doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, I've got a monitor that's inside the truck and it'll tell you, oh, we're running this many volts and it's charging at this much amperage is going in. But here's where I kind of ran into the first of my problems with how you set all of this stuff up. So the battery will tell you that it has a nominal voltage of 12.8 volts, which means just sitting at rest, like your car battery has 12.6, this has 12.8. That's what that's talking about. So the battery has a cutoff charging voltage of 14.6 volts which means you can charge it up to that. And at that point, the battery management system inside of there says, no, 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 we've had enough, we're shutting it down. So I think optimally, if you've got a battery that wants to sit at 12.8, you probably wanna charge it like 13.8 or, or 14 volts. Well, this charger says, here's, it's got some dip switches on it, and it tells you to set for this level of charging for 12.8, set it like this, for 12.9 or for 13 volts, set it like this. Oddly, I'm not sure why, but it actually skips all of the 13 volts. You can set it for like 12.4, 12.6, 12.8, and 13 volts. And then it goes to 14 volts and 14.2, 14.6, and it goes up there. It skips all the 13 volts. I don't know why. Maybe it's, it's unlucky or something like that. Hmm? But what it doesn't tell you and what I'm kind of confused on is it asking you what the nominal voltage 
of the battery is. So should I set the charger for 12.8 volts and it will just know, okay, I'll charge it at, you know, 13.6 or 13.7 until it gets to where it needs to be and then I'll bring my voltage down. Or am I supposed to be setting the voltage that I want it to charge at so that it can be a 12.8 battery when we're all said and done? And none of that is explained in the owner's manual for the battery or for the charger. So I'm not really sure which way that's supposed to go. So I set it for 14 volts because, I don't know, that's my best guess. All right, so here is the battery monitor that I purchased. You can see that it lists off at the top 13.31 volts is where the battery is sitting right now. And it'll tell you that it's 100% charged. Now that is something that has to be calibrated. So to calibrate it, I flatlined the battery so it just wouldn't run anymore. I just I ran it until the refrigerator just shut off. And then I, I calibrated this guy to say that, okay, well now we're at zero. And then I just drove around and let it charge until it had counted that it had pushed 50 amp hours into the battery. And now it's telling me it's at 100. But I don't, honestly, I don't know if that's accurate or not. And there lies the situation that I'm in, that I'm a little bit concerned that the monitor is telling me that it's 100% full, but because the monitor is just kind of working off of its own numbers and it's not, it's not related directly to the battery, it's not part of a whole cohesive package that the same manufacturer said, yeah, all of these numbers are correct. I don't know if it's correct. I'm going to assume it's correct. And the fact that the charger will charge at 20 amps and it's a 50 amp hour battery means in two and a half hours, if it's completely flatlined, two and a half hours later, it'll be full. That's just kind of how the math works. So I'm not terrified about this, that the way we do things, I like to camp overnight and then we go wheeling and then we camp overnight and then we go wheeling again. And in the amount of time that I'm gonna be driving around wheeling, it's gonna be charged up. So I'm fairly confident in the fact that this is all going to work the way it's supposed to. I just can't verify it. Uh, the only way to verify it is to have a failure and say, oh, well that wore out too fast and now I gotta figure out what's going on. And none of us wanna be out there on a camping trip with, you know, you got your refrigerator running, it's got meats in it and whatever, and you wake up in the morning and everything is warm because the battery only had half the capacity because it wasn't charged correct or whatever and because the monitor wasn't telling you the right thing. So I'm a little concerned about that. I'm not gonna say that this is failure, it hasn't failed yet, and I'm fairly confident that everything's gonna work fantastic and I'm pretty happy to have it in there. So I guess that leaves, my final thoughts here are, I kind of feel like we're at, what I don't know if it could be the infancy, but at least an early stage in the development of these lithium iron phosphate batteries and how they get incorporated into RVs and your secondary battery in your truck and, and whatever. I really wish, and I actually already said this to the guys at Vic Off-Road, who again, thank you so much for sending this out to me, and it seems it's going to do a fantastic job, but I really wish that they offered, or pretty much anybody offered, a whole cohesive package where, okay, here's a charger, here's the battery, here's a monitor, here's everything you need. We've tested these things together. What you need to do, you need to plug them in, and you need to figure out how to install them in your truck. And once all the components are plugged in together, they all work great. So that is a huge advantage, in my opinion, to all of these solar generators, portable power stations, whatever you call it, like the Jackery and the EcoFlows, that all of those things have already been figured out. The charging situation is figured out, the little display that it's got on there that tells you how much is left, it's all there. It's all done by the same people and you can kind of trust that this is all accurate. So there you go, that's my opinion now. And should my opinions change, if something goes really well, like, oh, I'm so excited about the way all of this works, or if something doesn't work so well, I'll give you guys an update, I'll let you know. For now, I really feel like this is gonna work fantastic, and I kind of feel like I'm actually gonna start leaving my EcoFlow at home, and I think this is gonna be a game changer for me. I think it's really gonna work out well, and now, because the battery is mounted under the hood, it's out of the way, it's secured, I don't have to figure out, okay, where am I gonna put it and stash this here, and as you're plugging cords into it, they're sticking out, and I don't want things banging. It. It's just all taken care of. So, I really think I'm gonna like this setup. So thank you for watching. Thank you to the guys to Vic Off Road that reached out to me and said, hey, we'll send this out to you so you can give it a, a try. Uh, I really appreciate that. So if you've enjoyed the video, if this has helped you out, give me that thumbs up. Uh, if you haven't subscribed already, please do subscribe. It really does help us out. Ring that bell so you get all the notifications. And if you're watching this and you think I'm a complete moron, you know, why didn't you do it like this? Or what's here and what's there? 
hit me up in the comments, let me know. I would love to hear how I got this wrong. Or if I didn't necessarily get it wrong, but there's better ways to do this or some ideas that you've got, or, or you can say, you know, take a look at this, take a look at that, or try this or try that. I would love to hear it. Uh, I think I'm fairly well versed in 12 volt electronics, but this is all completely new to me. So let me know where I got it wrong. Again, thank you for watching. I'll see you on the next one.